goodwill is one of the reasons why we practice. Wishing for our own true happiness, wishing for the happiness of other people, hoping that our true happiness will last. And as the Buddha points out, when you think about that, you realize it's going to have to be a happiness that doesn't cause any suffering to anybody. There's that passage where King Vicinity is with Queen Malika in their private apartment. And in a tender moment, he turns to her and asks her, Is there anyone you love more than yourself? Of course, he's hoping that she will say, Yes, you, Your Majesty. But she doesn't. She says, No. Is there anybody you love more than yourself? Of course, he has to admit that there's no one that he would love more than himself. And so he leaves the private apartment, leaves the palace, goes off to see the Buddha, reports the conversation he had. And the Buddha says, yes, she's right. And the conclusion he draws from that is that you should never harm anyone if you love yourself, because you realize that everybody else loves themselves just as fiercely as you love yourself. It's for happiness requires that they suffer. They're not going to stand for your happiness. It's not going to last. So as we meditate, goodwill is one of the underlying motivations. We want to find a happiness of high quality. The happiness doesn't conflict with anyone else's happiness. That's a special motivation. It's something that really should be maintained, protected. But at the same time, we have to realize that goodwill on its own is not going to be enough. In fact, the Brahma Viharas, as a set, are not enough. There's some books that have been floating around recently claiming that this was the secret teaching of the Buddha that somehow got lost by the tradition. And it's recently been uncovered that all you have to do is do the Brahma Viharas and it takes you all the way to Nirvana. The reading assumes two things. One, there's a passage where the Buddha talks about Union with Brahma. And one interpreter says that because he actually mentions the concept, and because for other people it was their religious goal, he must have thought of that as one of the names for his goal as well, which is hardly the case. There's that famous example where Sarabuddha goes to teach Dhananjanan, a Brahmin, on his deathbed. Don and Janan hasn't been meditating that much. And so sorry, Buddha, because what would be good for this person? He said, Oh, these Brahmins like the union with Brahma as their goal, so how about teaching him to get there? So, so he asks him, Would you like to attain union with Brahma? And the man says, Yes. So Sariputta teaches him the Brahma Viharas. And Don and Janan dies and becomes a Brahma. Achieves union with Brahma. And Sariputta goes to see the Buddha, and the Buddha says, You left him in an inferior attainment. He chides him for not taking him further. There's another passage where the Buddha is going to be leaving the monastery at the end of the rains retreat. And Mahanama comes to him and says, Suppose a person of discernment is dying when you're gone. How do I speak to him as he's facing death? And the Buddha teaches him first to make sure that he doesn't have any worries about his family, doesn't have any worries about leaving human sensual pleasures. If the person does have worries about the family, he says, look, you're dying. Your worries are not going to help them at all, so try to let go of them. If there are any attachments or concerns about leaving human sensuality, is to be told, well, there are better sensual realms, you know, there are the various devas, and he takes them up through the various deva realms one by one by one. Finally tells him even better than the pleasures of the Deva realms and the pleasures of the Brahma realms. Set your mind on those. 
And suppose the person can set his mind on the Brahma realms, union with Brahma. Then he's to be told, you know, even that has a sense of self-identity. They're still going to be suffering. It's still fettered. Set your mind on abandoning self-identity, the way you define yourself. And it's only then that you gain true freedom. So it's obvious that the union with Brahma was not a synonym for nirvana. Far from it. It's the Brahma realms are realms to be attained through jhana. The realms to be attained through jhana, and they are subject to birth, aging, illness, and death. Well, for them, aging and illness is pretty minor, but still, it's birth and death. You leave them and come back down again. So they're not the goal. And especially when you get to meet some of the Brahmas in the Pali Canon, they're not the kind of people you like to have union with. Some of them are hypocritical, some of them are pretty stupid. There's one who's a dupe for Mara. So it's hard to see how the Buddha would have regarded union with Brahma as a synonym for nirvana. And as for the practice of the Brahma Viharas, there are many passages where he says, just the Brahma Viharas on their own will take you to the different jhanas, and then they will correspond with these different levels of heaven. Some people think that the Buddhist cosmology was simply borrowed from what came before in India. But it turns out his, his cosmology was specific to him. The Jains had their cosmology. The, Upanishads had lots of different cosmologies, and the Buddhist cosmology was basically patterned on the different states of mind that you could attain in concentration that the Buddha discovered and mapped out. And one of the important things about his mapping out was realizing that the Brahmas are not eternal. In fact, he has to go up to the Brahma realms and teach them that lesson. What the Brahma Viharas can do is take you to concentration. And then based on concentration, you have to develop discernment. And that's a different practice entirely. It's based on concentration, and there is an element of discernment that comes in the concentration, but you really have to emphasize the discernment part. If that concentration based on the Brahma Viharas is going to take you to genuine awakening. Specifically, you develop the seven factors for awakening. You've got to be mindful. That means practicing the establishing, the establishing of mindfulness. For instance, you focus on the breath, ardent, alert, and mindful. You stay focused on the breath, and you put aside any greed or distress with reference to the world. And that quality of ardency is where the discernment starts coming in, as you try to do this skillfully and really analyze where there is suffering. This active part of meditation often gets overlooked. It involves both the observer, which is the more passive side, but then the, what you might call the director. It looks over the situation in the mind and tries to notice where something's wrong, and then what to do about it. The director asks questions. tries to think up solutions, and then puts them to the test, and then judges the results. It's not just plain old goodwill or compassion or empathetic joy or equanimity. You've got to consciously probe to see what's going to be skillful right now in your given state of mind. That's the second of the practice for awakening goes almost seamlessly from mindfulness into analysis of qualities, trying to figure out what is skillful and what's not skillful. And that moves into persistence, 
when you actually try to abandon what's unskillful and develop what is, what is skillful. When you do this skillfully, you got a sense of fullness, a sense of rapture. And then the mind settles down through serenity into deeper concentration and then equanimity. The equanimity itself, though, is not the end. The Buddha talks about levels of equanimity. There's the ordinary garden variety, which is you, when you simply try to be impartial, stay on an even keel, when sights, sa sight, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, ideas come to you, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant, you try to stay neutral towards them. That's your ordinary garden variety equanimity. But then there's a deeper one that's based on the, the formless realms formless jhanas. But even beyond that, there's what the Buddha calls non-fashioning, because even in equanimity there can be attachment to the equanimity. And if you don't analyze it, if you just have goodwill for the equanimity or goodwill for the attachment, it doesn't go away. You've got to question it. In John Mahabhava's language, you actually have to destroy it, try to find where the attachment is and just tear it to shreds. And that's when you see what lies beyond equanimity. The Buddha calls non-fashioning. That's where you're poised, ready to go to full awakening. So there's a lot of analysis that goes on in this. You can't simply th hope that having goodwill for your unskillful mental states will tame them. The Buddha said there are some unskillful states that will respond simply to equanimity, but there, there are a lot that require what he calls the exertion of a fabrication, where you have to change the way you breathe, change the way you perceive things, change the way you feel about them, change the way you think about them, ask questions, probe in. That's where the liberating insight has got to come. So the Brahma Viharas are not enough. They can get you to concentration. And they can be very soothing for the mind when the mind is feeling exasperated. They act as good antidotes to states of mind where you're feeling frustrated with yourself or frustrated with other people. But the results they give are only partial. You have to combine them with the seven factors for awakening. which there's a lot of analysis that goes on, a lot of probing and questioning, trying things out, experimenting to see what works and what doesn't work, and to dig into your attachment to goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. It's only then that the path is going to be complete, and the results will be complete as well. Some of the Thai Chans have a reputation for being really strict with their students. It's because they see that the states of mind you can gain, say, through the practice of the Brahma Viharas, the states of concentration, are really seductive. It's not that they're a bad thing. You actually have to do practice them, but you have to make sure that you don't stay stuck on them, because there's something so much better than just union with Brahma. There's absolute freedom, which is something else entirely. So it's out of concern, out of compassion, out of goodwill. But these teachers are really strict. Making sure their students don't fall for things that really need to be questioned. If anything, that's the lesson of the Buddha's own description of his path, as he kept questioning things until he found something that really did pass all the questions. So settle down, settle down, settle down. 
but then probe into it. Poke your state of mind with questions. That's how you learn.